Over the years, studies have shown that more than 80% of New Year's resolutions fail. Somehow, year over year, we keep this trend going by setting lofty outcome goals and giving up on them by February. Today, we're here to go over optimal targets or your North Star, the top pitfalls that sabotage your goals, and tactical strategies to help, your sh help you shift your mindset to create sustainable lifestyle change for a healthier you. So long as you follow along and participate, you'll be walking away from today's session with clear direction, with your wellness vision, and real actionable goals. Before we dive in, real quick, in case you don't know me, I'm Alicia Parker, National Board Certified Health and Wellness Coach specializing in lifestyle medicine, functional training, and sports and fitness nutrition. So what does that mean for you? I help people bridge the gap between their current lifestyle and the principles of lifestyle medicine or other desired goals um, in a satisfying way. And how do I do this? <laughs> By using behavior change psychology to guide people in taking on bridge behaviors every step along the journey. Micro commitments are key throughout the journey. And today we are here to specifically talk about the micro commitments you could choose to make as you take on resolving to be healthier in 2023. As we work through today's presentation, I encourage you to have your build your wellness plan collection of worksheets handy. And by the end of this presentation, you'll be able to identify your deepest motivators, um, establish long-term action goals based on evidence-based approaches, determine your bridge goals and short-term targets that will help you close the gap between your current reality and your desired outcomes. You'll commit to your first weekly steps and have a plan to reflect on your behaviors along the way so you can turn insight into action. After all, I always say motion breeds clarity. So how will we get there? Well, here's the roadmap for today. We're going to start with some vision setting just to unlock important and inspiring motivators to get both your head and your heart in the game. After that, we'll identify the six common pitfalls that make resolutions fall flat before even getting off the ground. Within that discussion, we'll talk through the six components of lifestyle medicine with a strong focus on two physical health components that take center stage when resolving to be physically healthier. Throughout the entire presentation today, I've sprinkled in some tactical strategies and key considerations that have been common themes that I've noticed when working with my one-on-one -on -one coaching clients. And by the end, we'll be tying it all together with some smart goal setting to give you clear direction on your own personal roadmap for the journey of health and well-being in 2023. I'm hoping we also have some time for Q&A at the end. Whether you think you can or you can't, you're right. The first step to success is envisioning what you want to experience or feel most. Envision the results you want and why. And you have to believe it will be your reality. You also have to understand that your current reality and accept your current reality and be honest about your current reality in order to shift your mindset. Don't put yourself in the box of your current limitations. Instead, view those challenges as relevant experiences to improve upon. Remember, if you can envision it, you can make it happen. And when the life you're living reflects the life you envision for yourself, you can find true happiness. So for a moment, I invite you to close your eyes here. If you're holding on to anything, put down pencils, uh, your paper, anything that you're holding on to, and take a deep centering breath. Connect fully to the present moment. 
And I want you to first let go of any attachments or limitations you currently have. It may even help you to visualize a frame and put all of those thoughts inside of that frame. For example, I should run a 5K, but I'm overweight and my knees hurt. Anything after the but goes into the frame. Now zoom out and imagine pathways beyond that frame. They may be hazy or out of focus but they are the road forward. At the end of each of those roads, begin to imagine a word or a phrase that describes what you want to feel most. This could be calm or peaceful, freedom, ease of movement, energy, belonging, achievement, confidence, while the pathways are still out of focus, we can clearly see the destination. Now say in your mind the feeling you want most. Say to yourself the state of being you want to embody. Imagine that one year from now you are experiencing that feeling. What will you be able to do as a result? What impact will you leave on the world around you? What will be more possible for you? This vision becomes your I want statement. So some examples of these that I've come up with with, with clients are, I want to be healthier so I can have more energy to be actively involved with my grandkids. Or... I want to live a healthier life so that I have freedom to explore the world and be spontaneous without worrying about my physical limitations. Just remember that those thoughts can be the fuel that inspire you, compel you to move forward. You'll notice here the cognitive triangle from cognitive behavioral therapy. And doing this vision setting work, doing the work to think through the thoughts that you're having and reframe your thoughts can actually influence the feelings that you have. And remember, your thoughts lead to feelings. Feelings lead to your behaviors. And your behaviors provide a direct feedback loop to more thoughts. If you truly want to change your lifestyle, it is imperative to change the narrative in your head and focus on what you want most, what your gains are rather than what you're losing. Now that we've thought about what you want most, feel free to open your eyes if you've had them closed. And write down your state of being or I want statement on your wellness plan worksheet. So if you have your wellness plan worksheet with you, you're going to notice that's at the top here. It's the top three on your worksheet. These state of being ideals should be important and inspiring to you. It's one thing to intellectually know why something is important. It's another thing to get your heart on board with the process. The why behind the what has to be compelling for your intellectual and psychological capacities. So as you're writing it down, also scale how important and inspiring it feels for you. Think of this in the context of your life. So on a scale of one to 10, 10 being the most important, rank how this state of being feels for you. It's also important here to identify the habits and current behaviors that are not aligned with this overall experience you desire. This is an opportunity to make a shift for more balance. Short-term sacrifice or adjustments for long-term gains. Identifying what doesn't serve you allows you to minimize that behavior in your life and replace it with healthy actions, behaviors, habits that align with your North Star vision. In this case, we're talking about health. Motivation is dialed in. We've turned up the volume. Now let's take 
time to go over some clear direction. In order to create your wellness plan, you must first identify the things holding you back from taking action in the first place. As John Dewey said, a problem well-defined is a problem half solved. Here are six of the most common pitfalls that lead to goals falling short. Clearly, they are not the most technical names, but they do serve the purpose of helping you identify what can sabotage your goals. And we'll go through in this order. First, shiny object syndrome. This is where you are inundated with conflicting messages. And rather than giving an evidence-based approach a full chance, you're chasing after the next fad and jumping to one thing and then the next. And day over day, you're not gaining any traction. With all of the conflicting information and analysis paralysis, you quickly fall into inaction. Next, we'll talk about fixating on outcomes. It can also be easy to get caught up in the data points and the metrics that you end up losing sight of the behaviors and processes that drive the outcomes in the first place. Yes, it is important to track outcomes, but it's just as important to focus on and track the behaviors themselves. Of course, you have to measure the right things. <laughs> the third is all or nothing. The feeling of needing to get it perfect or needing to do all of the optimal behaviors leads to a huge sense of overwhelm, which leaves us feeling hopeless and defeated before even taking our first step. This huge overwhelm causes us to procrastinate time and time again. Pitfall three is where we're gonna explore bridge behaviors that feel like the right size approach to help you see the next step in front of you while steering in the direction that you desire most. Fourth is it feels like a chore. It's really hard to stick to something when you aren't experiencing any joy in the journey. Where focus goes, energy flows. And when you get clear on what makes you tick and tap into what helps you feel satisfied, you can transform your thoughts and feelings driving your behaviors. Keeping it a secret. Growing up, there was a little rhyme, secret secrets are no fun. It's better to share with everyone. Now, while you might not shout this from the rooftops, it's extremely beneficial to share your goals with family and friends that are supportive create a network of accountability, and surround yourself with a community where well-being is the norm. We'll get into how to get the whole family involved when we get to this section. Last but not least, leaving it to chance. When creating a change, you must identify where you can create space for your new habits to live. Yes, there is some sacrifice of your current ways of doing things. Yes, it does require a growth mindset and experimentation. Success is not final, failure is not fatal, and by the time we get to this pitfall, we will create your SMART goals and go over the importance of measuring what counts, set intentions with a plan, take deliberate action, and self-reflect. After all, the after-action review may be one of the most critical parts of the entire process. We do not learn from experience we learn from reflecting on experience. Also, John Dewey. Shiny object syndrome, pitfall one, let's dive in. We overcome this pitfall with clear target behaviors and feasible outcomes. The outcomes may feel outside of your comfort zone at first. They might be a little bit uncomfortable, right? Get into discomfort. But the desired outcomes you set for yourself should avoid the delusional zone. By taking consistent action within your comfort zone toward the optimal targets, the outcome metrics that you set for yourself, right? The goals come to fruition without having to muscle through. Here, we'll review the optimal standards or the gold standards of lifestyle medicine. Just because it's optimal doesn't mean it's ideal for you, but we use this as the North Star to steer toward, to guide your micro commitments along the way. Of course, any progress in this direction is better than inaction. So in order for you, uh, for your changes to be ideal for you, they have to be ones that you can feasibly sustain. Also, before I move too much further, keep in mind that Maureen Bacella, an RD within the medical network at Chester County Hospital and Penn Medicine, is also delivering another session 
um, dedicated to getting started with dietary changes and some popular approaches on Monday, January 23rd at 6 p.m. Don't forget to register for that and mark your calendars. And just a quick reminder, you're here today, which means you've registered. Excellent. So we follow that same process. Don't overcomplicate things. Select which pathway feels most feasible for you and stick to it. Don't chase fads and trends. Really give what you choose a fighting chance. So each goal needs an approach that is relevant to the desired outcome. And many people, especially in the new year, talk about weight loss. Weight loss in particular requires a deficit, a calorie deficit. And you can actually gain your own clear personalized calorie targets from the NIH Body Weight Planner. And I encourage you to set your target for six months from now with a goal of about five to 7% body weight within that time. If you're looking at short term, a leading indicator for success with the outcome metric is to also target 2% weight loss in the first month. So I encourage you to do the math for yourself, figure out what that five to 7% target is for yourself, figure out what 2% is, plug those numbers into this quick planner, and gain your clear targets. Once again, that's the NIH body weight planner to gain your calorie goals. And you want to include the numbers that it gives you, especially the second number, the weight loss target, um, the calorie target. Include that in your wellness plan worksheet in the appropriate spots. So you'll notice on the worksheet, the outcome targets are the ones that are going to be the body weight focus. So do that math. And then you're going to put the actual calorie target within your, um, your calorie target section. So feel free to Google the NIH Body Weight Planner. Um, you will see something that looks like what's shown on your screen now. So how do we achieve those targets and adhere to a calorie goal when aiming at weight loss in particular? Let's take a look at the common ground that major scientific and medical organizations agree upon when it comes to nutrition and also exercise. You'll see here, many voices, one theme, eat more plants, but it goes further than that, right? Whole, unrefined, plant predominant food. So let's talk about lifestyle medicine, the full gamut. It's simple, powerful therapy that includes six pillars. So I'm going to read to you the definition directly from the American College of Lifestyle Medicine. Lifestyle medicine is a medical specialty that uses therapeutic lifestyle interventions as a primary modality to treat chronic conditions included but not limited to cardiovascular diseases, type 2 diabetes, and obesity. Lifestyle medicine certified clinicians, such as myself, are trained to apply evidence-based whole person prescriptive lifestyle change to treat, and when used intensively, often reverse such conditions. Applying the six pillars of lifestyle medicine, including a whole food, plant-predominant eating pattern, physical activity, restorative sleep, stress management, avoidance of risky substances, and positive social connections also provides effective prevention from those conditions. For today's discussion, we will use lifestyle medicine as the gold standard for those target behaviors. Today in particular, we will discuss two of these six components, nutrition and exercise, and create a plan for implementation. Of course, the other four components are foundational for being able to adhere to your physical health goals. So here are the specific recommendations and the visuals that you can take actionable steps towards. For nutrition, it's all about the healthy eating plate. I use this visual as a guide for the ratios with every client that I work with. You'll notice there are many components. Filling half of the plate with non-starchy veggies, making a quarter of the plate one serving of whole grains, focusing on lean protein, 
having a moderate amount of healthy fats and making water your preferred beverage. That's six components. That's a lot to consider on your plate. <laughs> this plate is your long-term target to guide your, your behaviors, but it likely is not your current reality. So look at the plate and identify which area of the plate needs the most focus for you. If you notice that right now your plate looks more like a third, a third, a third in terms of veggies, starch, and protein, maybe increasing the amount of veggies on your plate to crowd out the other areas is, is your main focus, filling half of the plate with non-starchy veggies. If you're already eating a lot of veggies, maybe you could work on switching to whole grains. Maybe you're simply looking to incorporate more plant-based proteins and eat whole, unrefined plant-based foods. Even simple swaps, like using olive oil instead of butter, is progress. The beverages you choose are also crucial. So whichever piece of the plate feels like it needs the most attention or would have the most impact, make that your short-term target. Do it, see if it works, and then double down if it's effective. So now that, now that we've gone over the plate, let's go over exercise. You've heard you can't outrun a poor diet, but I also want to point out that you can't eat kale as an excuse not to move. Intentional exercise is a crucial component to well-being. So the ACSM and CDC recommend 150 minutes of moderate intensity aerobic activity every week, along with two full body strength activities per week. Again, that's the recommendation. Of course, you can exceed that. Some of you might already be doing that and you're focusing on nutrition. But if your current reality feels too far from that, identify the steps that you'd be willing to take to start closing that gap. Maybe you set the long-term target to do a 30-minute brisk walk five days per week. But short-term, you identify that you could build into doing three days. And this week, that might require some preparation to identify the details of where, when, how you're going to make time um, and make space for all of that to happen. <clears throat> So remember, in order for a lifestyle change to be sustainable and effective, it has to be one you can realistically stick to, considering your current jumping off point, your season of life, your core values, and your other goals. The truth is, you might not be fully ready for the optimal targets of a whole food plant-based dietary pathway or 150 minutes of intentional aerobic exercise with strength training also per week. But you can certainly take your first steps onto the progress continuum. Pitfall two, fixating on outcomes. Remember, behaviors drive outcomes. And while it's important to track your results, to gather data for yourself on what's working, what's not, it's more important to accurately track your behaviors that you're changing. For example, if you want to lose weight, Track your calories in and calories out day over day, and that can provide crucial insight into the adjustments that you'd like to make next. If your goal is to create a healthier plate, track how many times within the day or the week that you nailed the metric of the ratio of a half a plate or food, meal, snack that is non-starchy veggies. Track specifically what you are working on, as well as the frequency of habits. You're going to see within your worksheet um, handout that I've included a monthly habit tracker to help you see how consistent you really are. When you use this habit tracker, create the chain, don't break the chain, and see how long you can keep your streak alive. If the streak ends, gamify the system. See if you can break your personal high score for the streak. As you take action or notice yourself falling into inaction, See how the outcome metrics respond. Maybe the number on the scale moves or your blood sugar moves up or down. Maybe it stabilizes. Let the behaviors and the process be your focus and simply use the outcome metrics as informational data points. Behaviors are leading indicators for long-term success. Pitfall three, all or nothing. 
we've been talking about progress over perfection this whole time. But how do you know if you're taking the right size step? There is a sweet spot that can help you feel engaged with your habits without falling into complete boredom or total anxiety. When stepping onto the progress continuum, aim to find flow. At the onset, you may find that you need to challenge your current skill set to build new skills. And as you increase your skills, the challenge actually decreases. You give it breathing room, let it stick, make sure your skills have truly caught up. And if you start to feel that boredom sets in, it's a surefire sign to level up the challenge to improve your skills again. It's important here to keep a pulse on your level of engagement. You don't want to get complacent and you don't want to feel defeated. So by choosing what feels like the right level of challenge and staying engaged, um, really focus on enhancing those skills and align with those outcome targets. As you take steps, you'll intuitively see what step is right in front of you. So don't overthink it, just choose the next right action. Keep a growth mindset as you experiment. You'll succeed, and I encourage you to celebrate that success. But you'll also undoubtedly run into fails. These are my favorite, they're first attempts in learning. Oftentimes we try to muscle our way through our implementation strategy that just isn't working. And we end up giving up on those long-term goals and targets because the strategy didn't work. Don't lose hope, don't give up on the goal. Instead, experiment with a different implementation strategy that still steers you toward your end goal. Pitfall four, it feels like a chore. When changes feel like a chore, flip the script in your head that guides your feelings and your behaviors. You can do this many different ways. And maybe you decide to uh, focus on an exercise modality that feels fun or provides a good challenge where you experience flow. Others really like to gamify their workouts and see how long they can keep the streak alive. One of the trends I've noticed going on right now are what I call workout snacks, where you have short chunks of intentional movement sprinkled throughout the day. For example, 10 minutes of walking three times per day. Maybe uh, it's about creating healthy swaps for foods you already enjoy, or exploring totally new recipes from around the world. It makes you feel like you're traveling in your kitchen. Find things that check the box of satisfaction for you, while also aligning with your goals. Keep in mind, a piece of satisfaction is filling up the stretch receptors in your stomach with foods that are nutrient dense while minimizing calories. This is where we refer back to the healthy eating plate and notice that crucial half of the plate non starchy veggies component. Much of the time, I also find that satisfaction with nutrition is elevated by practicing intuitive eating to guide when to start and stop eating, along with mindful eating. Allowing yourself to slow down and savor what you eat and actually experience the food fully often leads to better satisfaction and better portion control. Also, eating for reasons that are hunger, not for stress and emotions, is extremely beneficial. Being mindful while eating also helps you tune into your hunger satiety signals. Making mindful choices and intentionally paying attention to how food makes you feel can help you redefine what it means to be good in your mind. Now, I do have a full separate presentation on mindful and intuitive eating, and that actually includes a mindful bite, a guided mindful bite. And I don't have time within today's presentation to cover that, but I did want to take a moment to share with you some of the implementation strategies that have helped my clients rewire their thoughts surrounding their eating experience. First, chew thoroughly, eat slowly, put the fork down between each bite. Some clients even report holding on to utensils in the opposite hands to bring more awareness to their experience. And if you find that you're in a hunger emergency and find that you end up just scarfing down your food, you don't even notice it, 
one thing that many of my clients have mentioned is that if they are truly that hungry, they serve themselves a half of a portion to eat quickly so that they can start to get something in their system. Then they take a pause, maybe a one minute pause, maybe a five minute pause. Then they go back, get the remainder of their portion and they slow down using their mindful eating strategies. For emotional stress or boredom eating, we name and tame what is causing the urge to eat for reasons that are other than hunger with an alternative activity that will scratch that itch. Eating distraction free, making your eating time sacred time and avoid eating your projects, emotions or preoccupations. Start with a dedicated eating space and take a deep centering breath before lifting your fork. Cook the majority of your meals at home so that you can be in control of what's in your food. And if you have to eat out, decide on the strategies that work for you. It could be asking the waitress to pre-portion the meal in half so that you aren't tempted to overeat. Maybe look at the menu ahead of time to decide on a healthy choice. One of my clients calls this advanced menu scouting. Sounds very technical. And uh, tell your eating companion about your intentions to help you with accountability. It is important to remember here that there are days where you just don't feel like doing what you are envisioning for yourself. Trust me, we've all been there. Those are actually the most important days to do it. Have discipline. Maybe the initial excitement wore out and now it's just doing it and letting the habit stick. Having the discipline to show up and do what you say you are going to do for yourself really is what gets you started in the first place. That's what has you getting your feet on the floor, getting out of bed. And once that discipline gets you started, motivation keeps you in it once you're doing the task at hand. So keep those top three reasons in mind that we talked about in that vision setting and take note of the in the moment benefits as well. Long-term vision, short-term dopamine. <laughs> Pitfall five, keeping it a secret. So I wanted to share with you a study from the American Society of Training and Development actually shows that you're 65% more likely to complete a goal if you commit it to someone. And if you have an accountability appointment with someone, you're 95% more likely to complete your goals. Seek to share your goals selectively with people who are active supporters or who are going through their own similar journey. I say selectively share because there are those people out there who just won't get it. They all doubt your abilities and they actually may potentially sabotage you. So share it with those that ev evoke a sense of hope and discipline. Beyond that, it's important to surround yourself with a group of people that practice what you are setting out to do. If it's your whole family trying to get healthier, great. Work together to create your meal plan and be active. If your family is resistant, go ahead and seek support, circumvent it, seek support from others and find a group that is doing the healthy behaviors so you can have support as this way of living, this lifestyle becomes your norm. If you have kids at home, it can feel like a big challenge. Just remember that it's all about small steps. Start with the meals that you have the most control over for yourself. Maybe it's lunch and breakfast. Then as you're meal planning, attempt one new dinner recipe. Slowly transition to whole grains, start introducing. Offer a new lean protein option once a week or a new veggie. Rather than serving family style at dinner, you could prepare the plates before sitting down. And really be mindful to focus on your own plate and decide on your own personal role. This is your journey. Maybe you say, you know what? My criteria for myself is filling half of the plate with non starchy veggies. Remember, as a parent, there is a distribution of responsibility. You can be that transition person. You can condition them to eat healthy. You have the responsibility to decide what is offered. Kids then decide what out of what is offered they will eat and how much, focusing on their own hunger and satiety cues. 
Over time, they become conditioned to this new way of eating and it does become the family norm. So little steps and stick to it. Also decide on some movement parameters. Balance it so that your family has some leisure time and active time. Last but not least, leaving it to chance. And this is a big one that we're going to dive deep into. So the process for planning for success involves four steps. Starting with your intentions. That means really thinking about how you want to experience the day, your intentions for what you will do for the day. And then you leap to forethought. That's how am I going to get this done? How am I going to live in line with my intentions? So kind of planning ahead. After that, you take deliberate action. You set your intention. You planned it out. It has a home. Now it's a matter of doing it, having the discipline to say, nope, there's no other decision to make. I'm showing up for myself. And fourth, self-reflection. I like to say the best things in life are free but the best achievements in life are earned. Step outside of your comfort zone within reason. So avoid total comfort, but also avoid those delusional goals. The right size goal is one that feels like a little bit of a stretch, one that requires a moderate amount of effort and intention without a huge amount of anxiety. But also be sure to consider the season of your life, your core values, and commitments within the other life domains to ensure that your goal can actually really feel like a right size approach in your daily life. Over the course of the year, your long-term targets, you may decide on seven to 10 desirable outcomes or desired behaviors that you're aiming for. These big goals can be easily forgotten if you don't have an implementation plan. So now that we have an idea of the standards, the healthy eating plate, calorie targets, mindful and intuitive eating, and intentional exercise, as well as some outcome goals that make sense, such as 2% body weight loss in a month, 5 to 7% in six months and beyond, it's time to establish the milestones and benchmarks in the short term that can feel, uh, that you feel you can take on. Identify specifically what you want to do that would indicate you're on the right path in working towards your targets. Then we close the gap and experience gains by setting up your top three to five, and I say three to five pointedly, weekly goals that you can give deliberate focus to. This may be preparation work in reviewing your calendar. Maybe it's exploring recipes, creating a grocery list, deciding on your first meal prep experiment. Could be signing up for a gym, getting in touch with a personal trainer, a coach, or a registered dietitian, or finding a local community group that aligns with your needs. Once you have your weekly big three to five, decide on your daily big three that you want to focus on within each day. To help with the weekly habits piece of your wellness plan, which is actually at the bottom here, we also have a monthly plan or a weekly planner that can help you scope out what you want to do and also has a little bit of reflection at the bottom. So getting intentional about where things are going to live on the schedule and which days of the week you want to put things. For example, your meal plan. What day of the week is that going to be one of your big three? Your grocery shopping, your meal prepping, Decide on the day and set the intentions within your daily big three that work towards your weekly big three. Also works towards your monthly or your one month, your three month, your six month, and your long-term 12 month and beyond goals. Now, obviously, having a plan in place, um, it's helpful to set implementation intentions that are going to be compelling for you so that deliberate action becomes a no-brainer. For example, maybe the only time that you can find on your schedule to exercise is actually in the morning before work. Do some backward design. See how you can best support swift action in the morning. 
This could be setting the alarm or three alarms if you're a snoozer like me. Setting your clothes out and selecting the workout the night before. Maybe you say, okay, at 9 p.m., I'm preparing for my morning workout. And even have an accountability system. Now, if you're a lone wolf, maybe the streak tracker um, included may be enough. But if you're a social butterfly, maybe you have someone that you report your goal to using an app, a text message, uh, meeting up with a friend who's doing the same, or even just having your own personal role that you earn your shower or you have a sick day role. We'll talk about that in a little bit. With food, the implementation intention that takes the decision out of the moment at the most is priming the environment with the ingredients you need, which is eliminating and, and eliminating temptations from your environment. Planning on what you will eat and doing the meal prep with chopping ahead of time or packing your lunches to make implementation easy. Really ask yourself, it's one year from now, January 2024. The habit you were hoping to build during the year didn't stick. What is the most likely reason it will fail? Once you answer what the most likely reason it failed, once you answer that question, create your contingency plan. So I want to talk about those activation triggers and implementation intentions a bit further. So first, plan for your most common challenges and create if then contingency plans to give yourself first direction on how you plan to respond when faced with challenges without having to deliberate and make a decision each time. Avoid decision fatigue by setting your intentions and activation triggers and do that when you have a clear head rather than if you're in the moment, it ends up being a very vulnerable moment. Your emotions guide your decisions and that's when things fall apart. If you break your streak, maybe you follow, um, I call this the sick day rule uh, with my clients. You give yourself one free pass per quarter or per month. You're a human, you slip up, we, we all do. And maybe you say, okay, if I miss more than two consecutive days on my action step goals, that would be something that I would require a doctor's note from, right? And you would say to yourself, you know what? I missed yesterday, I gotta get back on track tomorrow. Don't just wait the whole week away. Say, what's the next right action? Didn't go great today. What's the next right action? When considering holidays or vacations, decide ahead on a minimum viable plan, your MVP, to help, help keep you um, on track. So giving yourself these parameters will actually allow you to loosen the reins a little bit without totally letting go. It will also give you the space for some self-compassion and guilt-free time while you're navigating special circumstances. Just keep in mind that not every day is a vacation or a holiday. So within the course of the 52 weeks in a year, make sure that the majority of those weeks are truly business as usual when it comes to your well-being practices. And I say practices because they really are something you practice on a daily basis, ongoing. Now, motion breeds clarity. Don't let fleshing out a fancy detailed plan cause procrastination. You now have the over overarching concepts as a foundation to build up your goals, your milestones, and your tasks, and tackle the tasks that feel most feasible in your first weekly habits. As you take action, aim to create small wins early and often to boost your self-efficacy, to boost your confidence, and motion breeds clarity, so it's okay if you don't see the full journey right now. All you need to see is the first step. And then once you're at that first step, you need to see the next step in front of you and ensure that each next step is steering toward those end goals. We learn best from reflecting on an experience, not from the experience itself. In order to unlock that wisdom and insight gained, perform an after action review. So I've also included, you see on the screen here, an after action review worksheet to in your handouts to help you through this process. So you wanna start with stating what you wanted to happen. Maybe you state your intentions, you, what, how you wanted to experience it. 
and then identify what actually happened. There may be a gap there. After you've identified that gap, gain insight for what caused the gap. It's especially important to notice any gains, even if it was something that was a total fail, a first attempt in learning, maybe you gained awareness as to what your triggers are that set you off. And you can say, okay, I'm gonna get back on track by trying this next experiment. So that's when we develop a plan to change your approach that directly implements the insight or helps you take on your next step. Perform this after action review frequently. And it could be in the form of your journal or your daily habit tracker that I showed earlier on the screen, um, or even in a weekly review. Doing this on a quarterly basis can really help you explicitly state your learning and your gains. And it allows you to celebrate your wins. And that then breeds more progress. And I definitely encourage you to revisit your wellness plan, revising your weekly habits every week, your short-term targets quarterly, and your long-term targets every six months. So let's talk about SMART goals. We want to be following the SMART formula because this is how you are going to make sure these goals can actually become a reality, right? They're not just dreams, they're goals. We're going to give those dreams legs, right? So in order to make your goals smart, specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, time-bound, ask yourself these questions. First, what exactly will I do? Then ask, how am I going to measure it? How will I know if I got it right? Then assess your confidence. How confident am I on a scale of 1 to 10 that I will be able to realistically achieve this goal with a moderate amount of effort? Imagine when I achieve this goal, how will I feel? How my, my, my experience might be different this time around? And lastly, it should be time bound. When do I want to achieve this goal by? So now with my last couple of minutes of the presentation before Q&A, um, let's take a look at a sample wellness plan that um, I have worked with a client. This is actually the first iteration on this wellness plan, but of course it has evolved since then, but I've captured what a sample initial wellness plan looks like. So you're going to notice here that there are the top three motivators and they're very compelling and they get this particular client's head and heart on board. You're going to notice words they use like freedom, ease of movement, energy, peace of mind. And giving the dream legs requires deliberate, consistent action toward the long term target. So they're aiming for that state of being, and they're going to do that by aiming towards long term behaviors. Now, you will notice here that this client did actually do the math. Um, for their percentage of body weight lost and also their NIH um, planner, their calculations to get their specific calorie target and weight loss projections based on the percentages stated earlier. And they've also identified some common challenges and set targets to help them overcome those. They also kept it realistic. Um, this client in particular did not feel that a whole food plant-based dietary pathway, that, that gold star, that gold standard, was really that uh, sustainable for them or feasible. And they did see, okay, what would be a step towards that? Maybe Mediterranean would be feasible and enjoyable. So that was something that aligned with their core value and it was still a step forward on that progress continuum. And they don't um, have the full picture set in stone um, at this point within their wellness plan. They actually point um, to the concepts without getting bogged down in the details of the strategies. And over time, that does become clearer. So if you have some ideas on your own long-term targets, or if you feel this is inspiring, feel free to screenshot, do your own calculations, but set, set similar steps in place, strategies in place. Zooming in now, I'm gonna take a look at some closer targets. So we set one to three month goals because they give a sense of urgency. 
And these are the big rocks that feel feasible with a moderate amount of effort and consistent action. Notice that the short-term targets are just a step toward the long-term targets. The short-term targets point to different strategies that they want to experiment with or try within the first month or the first three months. And they are actionable rather than state of being goals. They also follow the SMART framework. Um, this client recognized the need for enjoying the process in order to make it sustainable. And together we established some milestones that they can hit by being consistent with their weekly habits. And within the weekly habits, you'll notice that there's a lot of preparation work, especially if you look at the quality of diet focus and the calorie target. It's okay to set preparation goals so that you can get into action within a week or two. And there are other areas that this client was actually prepared to take action on already. And starting the first implementation experiments with mindful and intuitive eating, they, they, beginning that practice, um, got them in motion. You may also notice um, a strategy that I like to call temptation bundling. So if you look at this exercise goal and the weekly habits, um, they actually are setting their intentions the night before and they, they found a way to make it enjoyable by also selecting a podcast that they, they wanna listen to. And this is something that this client in particular said would actually get them out of bed in the morning because they are a, a morning exerciser, as you can see. So whatever you do, just get started. Tackle the first steps you see in front of you. Even if they feel like they're within your comfort zone, they're not a huge challenge, take the first steps. You don't have to have every detail of your journey completely mapped out. You can simply just take the first step, then reflect, then take the next step you see in front of you. Motion breeds clarity, so just get going. I'm gonna leave you with a quote from James Clear. With the same habits, you'll end up with the same results. But with better habits, anything is possible. Thank you kindly for your time. I'm open to questions.